Okay, everybody, it's that time again, time for our Stoic lesson of the week. This week is week 11 from our book, and it talks about moderation at mealtime. And while at first glance, when I first saw this, I thought it meant really just, you know, don't overeat, be, be mindful of what you're eating. They really took it and, and expanded and broadened that concept a lot deeper than, than I initially would have thought. You know, they, they have a quote here from Masonius Rufus who says, the man who eats more than he ought does wrong, which is the concept of overeating, and the man who eats in undue haste, no less, so eating too quickly, too fast, not paying attention to what you're eating, man who prefers the sweeter foods to the more healthful, and the man who does not serve food of the same kind or amount to his guests as to himself. But he also adds one more, which was very interesting. He talks about when we indulge in it at an unseasonable time. So there were many things that they touched on here when you think about food and the meaning of food to you in your life. You know, especially I think in uh, in, in several cultures, food definitely has a central theme uh, or, or essential meaning around the culture itself. You know, you think about the French and their cheese and bread. You think about the Germans and their beer and pretzels. You think about <laughs> the, uh, you know, the, the Japanese with their ramen and all of their yummy, very interesting delicacies that they have and sushi. And Kit Kat bars. And Kit Kat bars, yes. They, they do like their sweets, for sure. Oh, yes. And then, of course, I would say... And then America with everything else. <laughs> or all of those things. All of those things. Yeah. All of those things and then some. Uh, we, we as Americans definitely love our food. You know, I think, unfortunately, there's some that love it a little too much and put a little too much meaning around what that food represents, which is why our obesity rate is continuing to increase at such a rapid rate. But also, I think, you know, our lives... A lot of times the way we structure our lives are very much like hamsters on a wheel where we're just going from one thing to another, one duty, one activity to another. And so that's why fast food is so prevalent because you don't have to think about it. And that's really at the end of the day, what this lesson is trying to convey is really think about what it is you're eating, what it means to you, what it should mean to you, to your body. And just being a bit more mindful, they even say it's the stoic version of mindfulness on page 79. Um, one of the quotes that I, I loved is that um, when they were talking about cravings and, and, you know, they're like, listen, you can still have, you know, there's still this idea of cravings and you're not saying you're supposed to deny and just, again, as always, you know, suppress all of your feelings, but Right. Again, in, in moderation, in moderation, you don't want to eat ice cream every day. It's meant to be a treat. So I, I really, I, I like this, but even further, I think, Rob, you had mentioned that the thing that they even took it one step further was thinking about the source of your food and the environmental impact that not just your food has, but how that food is farmed how that food is cultivated, mm -hmm. where it's coming from, how far it has to travel. Does it do damage? Know? Does it do, yeah, is it is it harming in other ways? Even if it's a healthy food that you're eating, what, what harm is being introduced in order for that food to get to you? So yeah. I thought that I that like was how they really say, Yeah. I like how they say on, on page 78, because eating is such a frequent and mundane activity, we tend not to pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. And so, so much of what they're doing with us in this, in this book, this 52 week journey for new Stoics is they're bringing our attention to things that just like go on autopilot, right? Like you just you shove something in your mouth and you don't think about it. So again, it's like for, for most people they eat at least three times a day, you know, you, three meals, snacks, drinks in between. It's just, it's a constant that you don't think about it. And so while they're not saying aim for perfection, they're saying just bring your attention to it. And, and in so many ways, like you said, it's surprising how many different things they brought up to us this week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, they also talk about um, 
pursuing pleasure over nutrition, but they are not incompatible. You can have both. And so often yeah. we think that we are, we have a cheat meal or we're, den we're denying ourselves what we truly want. And so that creates a whole other psychological behavior in and of itself. So I really like that. And they said, you know, eating, eating food stuff that is sweet rather than salutary. So eating things that are sweet, but they don't satisfy you like candy or Skittles. Why are you looking at me? <laughs> Skittles! <laughs> Yeah. Is that is that the magic word around for Rob Skittles? At work, they used to have free Skittles until the obvious outbreak of this virus. So I Aww. would walk by and grab them all the time. But it's because they were there. Now that they're not there, I don't eat them. And I don't think about Skittles as much. So that's a perfect stoic lesson that was imposed before this <laughs> chapter. Go my heart. <laughs> yeah, but it, but it is, it, it's when something is taken away from you, you notice it. So the next time I do have Skittles, I'll go, oh yeah, I used to eat these every single day. It's probably a good thing mm. I don't eat these every single day. But while I have this handful, I'm going to enjoy them a lot more than when I had them every day. It became routine. Right. Yes, exactly. In your mouth. You didn't even notice. Right. Yeah, I, uh, I, go ahead. I love this chapter because it, it, I mean, it was, it was so much about the mindfulness piece of it. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, this is my jam right here. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it made me even think, cause you know, the, the whole, the whole overarching, um, purpose of this is again, going back to the stoic principles. And you talk about this in your course, a lot at the end when you talk about your stoic blueprint but you know one of the four cardinal virtues is temperance and finding ways to practice temperance and so i think this was a great example of being able to say i'm going to be more mindful and conscious of what i'm eating and they talk about that you know our our one last time was do the opposite and they said you know the intent is to kind of kind of continue that in this week's lesson by you know, when you have a craving of something, do the opposite, you know, go for a walk, drink a glass of water, whatever it might be. So, but when it comes to your desire around food or the craving, before you immediately give into it, you immediately react to it or grab the thing. Cause you know, they say, don't have it in your house, which that's fine, you know, but every once in a while you should be allowed to treat yourself just so long as you have that temperance that you can practice. But when you have that craving, at least for this week, kind of pause and think, am I really hungry? What is the, wh why am I grabbing this? What's driving it? I think it, I thought it was a great exercise. And for me, it really, it really highlighted because I've been going through this nutritional journey right now with a functional medicine doctor. And really I've always eaten very healthy, but I've, and I've paid attention to what I've consumed, but not to the level of like a macro tracking necessarily so now i'm even more mindful before i just naturally grab something that i know because i've structured the food around in the house to support the protocol that i have to follow but even then i'll pause and go do i really need this right now or not why why am i grabbing it am i just bored uh, or is this going to tip me over into or is this going to get me a little too close to my threshold and i want to add i want to have a little bit more buffer because i know what I want to eat for dinner. So I don't want yeah. to upset that apple card. So I think this was, it was perfect. I was like, oh, I got this. And as a sidebar, I will say that what a lot of people don't realize that I have learned as it is understood to me is the same part of your brain that tells you you are hungry, that, that senses hunger is the exact same place of your brain that senses thirst. So a lot of times what we take as a message of hunger is actually a message of thirst or early dehydration warning. Mm -hmm. So that's why if you've ever talked to a nutritionist, they will say, if you feel hungry, first drink a big glass of water and then wait and then see if that signal is still there. Because mm -hmm. most of us are dehydrated anyway. So Yes. Well, that's interesting. Yes. I, I didn't know that fact, but I've noticed that anecdotally. Or sometimes I'm hungry. I'm like, oh, but I'm also thirsty. So let me drink this water. And I'm like, and I walk away and I forget that I was hungry. Mm, so there's right. obviously some anecdotal truth to that. But I think the idea to go back to what you said here is 
it's about being mindful about what you do, even your eating. Because as you pointed out, it is something we do so automatically and we fill our pantries with food and we have snacks and you have a son who is obviously growing and needs a little bit of extra nutrition. So those snacks are always there and those temptations are always there, but those autopilot temptations become more and more and more and more when they're there. And what Amy's taught me over the years is she's always <gasps> been, well, but you've always been super cognizant about what you eat. You always think about it and do this. And I never have. <laughs> I'm always like, I'm like, don't eat that. You're going to get diabetes. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Don't eat the Skittles. It's about eat the Skittles, man. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's <laughs> taking it to that next level of just saying, okay, I'm going to pay attention to what I'm eating and what I put in my body. And I think yes. one of my big realizations as we're filming this, we're still in this coronavirus pandemic. The only, one of the things that I can control is my health, at least to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. So that is incorporating the decisions I make and what I put into my body. So the less Skittles I put in my body, the better. The more broccoli I put in my body, the better. And, and we talk about being prepared and we talk about having supplies of food and we talk about having water, but we never really boil it down to, particularly when it comes to a virus, if you have a healthier immune system, a healthier body, you're more likely to be able to fight the virus off than not because we're seeing the people with certain conditions, chronic conditions, comorbidities, we've come to call them, are suffering the most because of this. Mm. And a lot of those, let's talk like grownups here, are because of decisions that we've yes. all made years and years and years ago. And the functional medicine doctor Amy was talking about, he says, your body does crazy things to survive in the short term. So your body will mm. build plaque on your, on your arteries to survive in the long term. Even knowing that it's harmful long term, but the body's idea is mm -hmm. all right, I need to survive today. We'll figure Short out term. tomorrow, tomorrow. And yep. you know, you have inflammation, then that becomes a blockage, and then it becomes too inflamed, so on and so forth. Or it channels, I don't know exactly the physiology behind it, but his way he explained it was, you know, your body is excellent short term. You have to outsmart mm -hmm. your body essentially, or work with your body is probably a better way to say that over the long term. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's going to be sure. through a virus, the next pandemic, or just living in general. Right. Yeah, and it's it's funny too. I remember years ago when I when I first was seeing um, an Eastern medicine doctor, and he put me on a, a diet protocol to help heal my adrenal glands. Um, and I was on it for, I think about six weeks and then I went back and then we kind of like retested some things and he's like, so, you know, tell me how you're feeling. And I was like, okay, well, so this was kind of hard. I said, but like, I've noticed some things like my eyesight seems better and like, I can smell better and, and I taste things more. I'm like, is this crazy? And he's like, no, he's like, <laughs> when you put better, when you put foods in your body that support your body it works better. So just think about like putting high quality oil in a car, like you put high quality stuff in there and you're going to get like that maximum performance. Um, he's like, no, it's not crazy at all. He's like, I'm glad that you're noticing that difference. And, you know, to your point, Rob, it, you know, my husband and I, we talk about it all the time about how choices, whether it be short term or long term choices that damage your body do put you at more at risk for coronavirus. And but here's the best part is even if you get healthier in an attempt to try to strengthen your body against coronavirus, it still is its own reward because like, even if all, when all this is done, like you've still got a healthier, better performing body, you're going to feel better. Like it, it, it rewards itself. It perpetuates that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that temperance or in, in case people don't know what temperance is, it's like moderation or I love how they say do things in just measure. It's having that moderation of and, and that noticing and also the, the knowledge. I mean, let's face it, a lot of times, you know, people um, eat all the Skittles because they, they don't know that you shouldn't just eat Skittles all the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, but it is its own reward. And, and people, you know, there's a reason why you treat your body like a temple because your health is one of the few things that you have control over, at least mm -hmm. the things that you do have control over. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Just then they even mention here on page 80 at the bottom, uh, quoting Cicero, who was a politician, her own politician, you know, we've all heard this term, but at the same time, we don't 
naturally always think about it in this way, which is, you know, you have to eat to live, not live to eat. And, you know, one thing that just one more quick note before we wrap this up, one thing that I just recently learned about, and we actually ended up having a, a, an additional conversation with one of our uh, friends who's half Japanese, the Japanese have this idea called harihashi. And we just recently learned about this, but harihashi is when they approach food, it's this idea of 80% full. So whenever they feel like they're at, they're, they're satisfied. They're not stuffed, but they can feel like they're satiated. It's this term harihashi. And basically it's their way that when they're 80% full, they stop eating because they also understand that it takes about 30 to 40 minutes for the body to fully fill up, to, to, to signal, to create the connection that, oh, you've eaten enough. Because how often have we all, we've all been guilty of it, where we have truly stuffed our faces mm -hmm. and then you are in agony you know, for hours afterwards because you just ate too much. <laughs> You're just like, why? Why did I do that to myself? So this is a great tie-in with this is practicing a little bit of our own, you know, American version of Harihashi. <laughs> I want to add to that. We were had a, a conversation. I don't even remember who this gentleman was. Just a guy we met somewhere and he says, when he eats dessert, he eats three bites. Because he says, science shows, studies have shown, you don't remember anything past the third bite. So you'll remember mm -hmm. what the dessert tastes like without having to overindulge. Mm -hmm. And he was an older guy, probably a retiree, 60, 65. He may have been in your parents' community. I don't remember. Well, maybe. And he's like, yeah, that's my trick. It's like, I'll have dessert. I don't have it every day. But when I do, if it's a piece of pie or something, I take three bites. Because my mm -hmm. mind knows, ooh, that's really good. And I'm not going to remember anything past that third bite. So that's where I stopped. So he's trained himself stoically mm -hmm. to indulge a little bit but not overindulge. Well, exactly. Mm -hmm. You can enjoy life, yeah. enjoy food, just don't overindulge so that you get diabetes, heart disease, all the things that are because of our overindulging of high fat, high sugar. Sure. Or find alternatives foods. that you enjoy. Yeah. You're right, yeah. like healthier alternatives. Sure. So for example, last Trick night we, brain. we had snack of pineapple mm -hmm. rather than ice cream. Right. Because pineapple is delicious. Mm. It is. It's a pain to cut up, but once you cut it up, it's <laughs> that's why that's why I made him do it. <laughs> yeah, well, he's a master. That. He's yeah. a master at the mm -hmm. cutting. Yeah, gets better with practice. Mm -hmm. Well, and one of the one of my favorite shows. Um, there's an author by the name of Michael Polan, and um, he writes about food. And he writes uh, actually. Um, uh, shoot, just it just escaped me the his program, but. Um, he talks about how so many of us are so disconnected from our food sources. Mm -hmm. And this is just by nature of our industrialization of our society. But he, he talks about how he goes and talks to farmers. He goes and talks to people who raise animals that for, for consumption. And he says, if everybody really understood where their food came from and how their food got to them versus just it's something in a package, it's like, it would bring so much more mindfulness to your choices. Um, and I love the way he approaches the, the entire thing, but that mindfulness, I think, you know, a great way to practice it is eating for the same reason that they say it's easy for us to forget because it's, we do it so many times a day and it, it, we're so used to it, but what a perfect way to practice it because it presents itself multiple times a day. There's no like having to seek it out. There's no having to go sit down and find a place to meditate. Like, let when you eat something allow that to be a mindfulness practice and i think even to to add to that sierra just you know one of your lessons you talk about the idea of gratitude and rituals and habit and when you think about that that when you think about this idea of just pausing for that mindfulness that's a perfect opportunity right before you eat you know some people would call it a blessing some people would just call it thankfulness but taking that moment and pausing before you start shoving that food in your mouth and maybe that gratitude or that that you know that thankfulness is thinking thinking you know whatever or whoever helped create that food that's on your plate because it didn't yeah. come from somewhere it did, yeah mm -hmm. whether you think yeah. that as god or just the earth or any variation in between well but it was someone's work well it and that's was, true too. Know, mm -hmm. someone yeah even if work. it's non-spiritual you could say 
thank you to the animal, thank you to the farmer, thank you to the, you know, the person who made these, mm -hmm. you know, this item or whatever, mm -hmm. um, and bringing your attention to it. Um, but, uh, and again, you could add your own spiritual practice as well. But that pause, or, or you can even make it completely something different. And just before you put something in your mouth, just say, thank you for the ability that I have to eat something. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's to afford the food or to have the, the ability to, to chew the food. I mean, these are things we don't think about because we are lucky, but there are many people um, less lucky than we are. So mm -hmm. taking that moment to just be grateful for what you have. Um, but I, I thought this exercise was very helpful in, in the mindfulness that they, that it brought. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and some of the examples that they gave that you could have practiced was, you know, uh, if they talk about the hazards, which is what Rufus talks about, um, you know, eating too much and instead intentionally limit your portions. So pre-portion it out or just you know weigh your food that's something that is new to me that i hadn't done before but it has been eye-opening because even as someone who has always eaten very healthy and been very mindful about what i eat at the same time now that i have to just take it that one step further with this macros i'm like oh okay maybe maybe i wasn't eating as well as i thought i was because of you know, the volume of the item or the combination of the foods, you know, I, I always thought, oh, I'm not eating a lot of fill in the blank. But as I start to track it, it's like, oh, it's actually very eye opening. <laughs> what you learn, you're like, oh, okay, maybe I was consuming a lot more than I thought I was. Uh, they yeah. also and talk bringing about your attention to it is the yeah. very first step. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, eating too quickly slowing down that's definitely rob it's like wolf it down because i don't know there's going to be ninjas who are going to come steal it from you i don't know <laughs> well it's funny because my dad is the fastest eater i've ever seen he always eats insanely fast he doesn't talk during the mid just eats and when he's done he talks so i picked up that habit <laughs> so you can start talking again <laughs> yes exactly but that's probably it. But I've noticed, man, I eat really, because I'll be done with my whole food and Amy's still eating her first portion. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. So that was a nice, oh, slow it down just a little bit. See yeah. what happens. Mm -hmm. Although I still eat my broccoli fast because, you know, I want to get, get that off the plate as fast as possible. <laughs> Not his favorite thing. No. You know, eating. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I'm grateful to the person that chopped it up and put it in the bag for me mm -hmm. and farmed it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There you go. Little moment. Little for the moment. fiber. Let's for the, to the broccoli fairy. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and for the good fiber it's giving you mm -hmm. in your body. Uh, they talk about eating for pleasure and instead, you know, aim to eat less of whatever that thing is that right now maybe you have some sort of emotionable, emotional, <laughs> emotional, emotional pleasure trigger associated with it. And again, it's not saying completely deny it, but maybe initially, yes. So if you want cake, instead, maybe have an apple or, you know, something that's less popular, but it still has that sweet sweetness that maybe you're craving. Taking more, or this was an interesting one, which I, I, I don't know if we have anyone in our circle who might do this, but we have to have slap some hands. Taking more or better food than others at the table which is interesting mm. serving yourself the bigger piece of meat or you know not ensuring that there's enough portions for everyone to go around if it's something like a family style meal and then yeah. putting off well, i can tell you yeah. I, I i am the opposite of this in my house because i usually am if i like especially we, we just got back from a, a trip a seven week trip in our camper and if you've ever been in a camper, you know that the fridge is small, the kitchen is, everything's small. It's like living in miniature, right? So I would make the food. I would try to like guess the right amount to make the food. But when I, when I serve everybody's plates, a lot of times I realize that I kind of haven't really made enough. So I, I always catch myself. I'm always giving my son and my husband more food. And then like I'm taking less food because I want to make sure that they have enough. And then I'm like, in my head, I'm thinking like, okay, if this isn't enough food for me, I know I can have a scoop of peanut butter. I know I can have like a nectarine or whatever it is. I'm like, I've got that backup plan. 
So um, I, I read that and I'm like, hmm, okay, that's not me. That's the opposite. <laughs> yeah, which means you might have to put a little bit of that into your, you know, make sure that you get being too mindful, in yeah. other words. Or being too self, <laughs> too sacrificing. Yes. yes. Yeah. Right. You know, everyone but now everyone that's... equally should share in the the, the sacrifice, the portions mm -hmm. a little bit, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now that we're now that we're back home, we got home last night, it'll be a lot easier to to manage the, the food stuff. Full fridge. <laughs> Best thing. <laughs> Big fridge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And then the last one they talked about was putting off duties to eat. So basically, um, you know, you, you're stopping in the middle of what you're doing or something that you're supposed to be completing in order to eat, which I don't think, I actually think that at least in, I would say in, in American society, I don't think this is more of a problem. I think truly the opposite is probably the problem where too many people are eating at their desks, like eating while they're still typing and working and everything. And that's, that's yeah. the opposite. That's, that's just as bad but it just depends on what you're trying to avoid or accomplish in the, in, in the time that you have so at work yeah. you're overloaded and swamped at home if it's i could do laundry or i could fix this but oh look i'm gonna eat, I'm gonna eat a snack instead oh look now there's a football game on ah oh, so you don't get your tasks done i've definitely fallen into that trap before where avoidance mm. by whatever means necessary of something I don't really want to do, rather than just getting it done and getting it over with. And let food be the, the I won't say the reward, but the, the natural thing that you have to then do after you're done with your task. Sure. But I think we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, just that, that the longer you put something off, the more painful mentally it is. Mm -hmm. So if you just do it, rip the bandit off, get it done, if you don't want to do it, then it's done. Mm -hmm. Right. Otherwise, you're thinking about the thing you don't want to do all the time. Yep. All right. So biggest takeaway, everybody, from this, or the thing that you're going to be more mindful of when it comes to your food. Rob, you go first. Just being more mindful about food in general and, and the process of the food. I really liked the pace of the food as a fast eater. Mm -hmm. And I really like thinking about beyond the food and what i mean by that is what sierra brought up and you brought up amy in that there was a process because we live in the convenience era if mm -hmm. when you know 100 years from now they're going to look at 1920 to 2020 as a period where life became super convenient the fact that we can go to the grocery store and hey look there's meat there's salad there's anything you want essentially or if not you can get it on amazon it comes right to you you don't have to go anywhere to get it so taking that process and at least thinking about that process because there is a process behind it. That is my biggest takeaway along with just the pace of it. And they tie together too, because if you slow down, you can appreciate that we live in this amazing time in the year 2020, despite the fact that we have a pandemic going on, we still can get basically anything we want within five or 10 minute drive, maybe 30 minute drive or have it delivered to your door. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. How about you, Sierra? You know, I think, I think my takeaway is, as, uh, this is tough. So, uh, you know, on our trip as well, we had, um, we had a major problem with our fridge and our camper where um, the, the fridge wasn't working properly and we actually had to throw out what little food we had because it had spoiled in the fridge. So it, it really did bring to me that, um, it was, was just this during this week of, of as we were working on this it definitely brought up in me as the you know I'm kind of in charge of food in my house and that was super stressful because it was like okay now I don't have like a, a big thing of a portion of food that I that I would have fed my family so I think for me it's I'd like to just cycle back and actually bring back that moment of thankfulness when we're sitting down to eat food because it is it's something you just you forget and you just eat it and you don't think about it and you kind of move on so that really brought my attention to like being thankful for cold food mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think we're gonna as a family revisit and now that we're home in more of our, our normal environment kind of kind of bring that that ritual mindfulness back to, to food times yeah and I think to that point 
even even taking it a little bit further beyond or maybe even a little bit closer i should say than where it came from but so often i think that we all can forget the amount of work that goes into preparing the food you know sometimes it can take hours of preparation sometimes it can just take a couple minutes but still there's work invested in to create this meal and then everybody just sits down and eats it and it's gone in 15 minutes or you know however <laughs> for Rob maybe five I don't know mm -hmm. he's quick eater but you know what I'm saying like I think so often as the as the consumers of the food we don't always recognize that but I think that I, I would encourage all of us to acknowledge and I say this to you as well Sarah but acknowledge the person who prepared the food for for us and that includes not just the person who made it, put the effort in the kitchen, but before the kitchen. Yeah, well. obviously the before the kitchen, but I'm but I'm also talking about the kitchen. So don't overlook the immediate preparation that went into it as well, because it was more than just, you know, putting something on a plate. There was right. there was the planning, there was the meal planning, there was the shopping, there was the chopping, there was the prep. You know, there was there was work involved in that that we sometimes. Uh, don't don't necessarily think about and I think that that's yeah having appreciation for it so we can appreciate the farmer the food the you know all of that but also appreciate the person who prepared the meal as well what was your big takeaway Amy so mine was really just the really being mindful about what I'm consuming in so far as what it's made up of Right. So thinking back for me, I have to actively right now. And I think it's a good thing to continue to do, even though I was always someone who was like, ah, macros, that's too much. I can't do that. That's, I don't want to do that. That's for people who are like super, super obsessed with things. But I've really started to enjoy it and see how it plays out over the course of a day or a week. So I think for me, really going forward, even beyond what I'm doing right now by doctor recommendation, is to just really think about and look at, I've always looked at the labels and I've looked at the ingredients and I've looked at the grams and everything that's been included, but I've not really thought about that in, I've thought about it in isolation. Like this thing that I eat is under X grams of fat, under X grams of carbs, under X grams of sugar. It doesn't have hydrogenated blah, 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 right? Like I've looked at that, but I've never thought about how is this thing in context of everything else that I'm consuming throughout the day. So that's really the big one for me, I think, is just being able to apply a little bit more uh, mindful math to the food that I'm consuming. Mindful math, I like that. Yeah. All right, so excellent job, everybody. We are going to be mindful foodies now in the future. And taking that further, of course, because as they said, the rest of the rest of this uh, this section that we're focusing on is all about desires. <laughs> right. And so week 12, we are going to be talking about temptations and how to uh, put them out of sight, put temptations out of sight, you know, the out of sight, out of mind. But I'm curious yep. to see where this builds on it because you can't hide from temptations your whole life. Like we always talked about, uh, you know, the difference between Stoicism and Buddhism is Buddhism, they can just kind of go in their huts on the mountain and, and isolate, whereas Stoics, they take the same, a lot of the same concepts, but they're in the thick of it. They are in the world, doing the things, <laughs> interacting with the people day in and day out. So I'm curious to see yeah. from a meditation standpoint where they go with this, since you can't just hide from it. Yep. I'm it's going to be interesting. Mm -hmm. Stay tuned. Might be actually a little bit easier in these times than <laughs> in true. times past true. or times future. I don't that know. That might be the but perfect time I, to actually have the lesson. But if, if you're interested in joining us, if you're interested in learning more, the book that we use is a handbook for new Stoics. And we've got a Facebook group. You can log on. You can join us. You can follow along. You can catch up or you can just hop on where we're at. Um, and comment and be part of the conversation. We'd love to have you. Absolutely. So until next time, keep being stoically awesome. <laughs>